Very good. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dan Sinning from ICLR. Thanks very much for joining us, and uh, apologies for the uh, technical problems we had there. Uh, it doesn't look quite the same as normal on your computer, um, but hopefully you'll be able to see it well. Uh, I understand that we have a lot of people on the line. Um, if for some reason you're not able to join WebEx because we have a limit of 100 people, uh, don't worry because we're recording the session and uh, you'll be able to watch it later. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Kathy Ryan, who's here from University of Calgary, uh, to talk to us about uh, groundwater flooding. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as far as I can tell, I'm here because I listened to a presentation by the uh, ICLR at a Canadian Water Network meeting. And I think I took the speaker to task afterwards, but he's forgiven me and, and uh, invited me here. So I'm really happy to talk to you about the role of groundwater in flooding and, uh, and the role that our undergraduate students came in bringing this to my attention, or played in bringing this to my attention. So I am going to subject you to a little bit of science, but not too much, and I'll just start out here uh, with a little bit about river flooding and prediction in Calgary. Uh, and before I get into some photos of our 2013 flood, which was a huge event in the city of Calgary. I want to thank my colleague at the University of Calgary, Jerry Osborne, who is a superficial geologist with a particular interest in river flooding. An undergraduate student, Jason Abood, who is doing a fabulous job uh, looking at what happened in the 2013 flood. Two master's candidates that came and had a great time working with us from uh, Dutch, a Dutch University, and also the city of Calgary, who is uh, quite collaborative from the get-go on this. So in 2013, we had a significant flood with lots of overland flow, lots of devastation, and lots of sad stories and good stories. And I think that you've probably uh, all seen many of these images, but probably what you haven't seen is what's typically under the radar in water science, and that's groundwater or hydrogeology. Um, and so we had lots of property devastation. This is a picture that uh, Jerry Osborne took and you can see that there's an outcrop here and an outcrop here. This is a, a day trip on the Elbow River with the falls here. And there's actually a road that goes back in between these trees and after the flood here there, everything's been washed out and tons of sediment deposited in a different place. And we had lots of similar damage within the, the city of Calgary. And Lots of public interest in building infrastructure to mitigate this damage, and much of this infrastructure would not be effective in the context of groundwater flooding basements. So talking about rivers and flooding, uh, everybody in Calgary seemed to have been very surprised at, that we had as big a flow as we did, but if you talk to Jerry Osborne, he would say that he's told every single first year geology class that that kind of a flood is imminent since he started teaching uh, 20 or 30 years ago. So here's a graph which has the peak discharge of any given year, and it's every two years from 1912, with a couple of high flow years where we actually had record early on until 2013. And here's the 2013 flood, and you can see that the discharge here was up over uh, 1,700 cubic meters per second. And we don't often have uh, high discharge, but we do have it historically. And we have lots of evidence that we've had it historic, historically. So here's a photograph of downtown Calgary uh, in 1897, which is the first year of high flow on that map. And here's the Center Street Bridge, which looks very different today. 1915, 1929, hundreds of city homes menaced by the rivers. 1932, Memorial Drive, which, is, uh, which was underwater in 2013, was underwater. And Sunnyside, which was largely underwater in 2013, was also underwater. So hydrologists have taken these data for a long time, and they plotted them up. And when they plot them up as the annual maximum discharge, which is what we just saw on the graph uh, with time on the bottom, versus the percent time that it's exceeded, it forms a logarithmic uh, plot, a log logarithmic distribution. And so here we have predictions based on two different data sets of how many, how many, uh, what percentage of the time this discharge would be equal. So not very much, not very many uh, years would you have a high discharge, but in every year you would have a discharge that exceeded the lower plot here. 
And another way to, to plot this is on a log scale here, so you can have large river flow, not very often, and high river flow, sorry, large, uh, low river flow, very frequently, and high river flow, uh, not very frequently. The, the only problem with this, so we can say very confidently now how frequently we expect very high discharge events. We just can't say which year. So every year, it's like you roll a dice, and whether or not you have high flow is anybody's guess. And I think insurers probably understand that much better than, than many people. So we have all of these data, and we know how frequently they will exceed uh, 1 in 10, 1 in 50, 1 in 100, etc. And using these data then, the hydrologists make a river maps. So I want to talk a little bit about flood mapping, which has been highly political in Calgary because lots of people were concerned that they were flooded but weren't on the flood map, or they weren't flooded and they were on the flood map, etc. So hydrologists take these discharges and they model the water going through the river. And then they look at the stage of the river and the elevation of the ground, and they determine how far away from the river this flooding will happen. So this is only overland flooding. It doesn't consider at all groundwater flooding, which is what I want to talk to you about today. And here's a, a, the provincial flood maps that were in effect uh, when the 2013 flood happened, and I'll talk about these different colors in a moment here. But there was a map that was that was drafted for the City of Calgary and the province by one of the environmental consulting firms. And I'll just show you the difference in the 2012, so this was done just before the flood here, map and the, and the pre-existing map. So here's some distinctive geographic areas which are outlined in red here on the two maps. And so in particular, you can see here in between these red areas, uh, in the earlier flood version, they were mapped as underwater and in the later flood map, they, they were mapped as not underwater. So here's what really got my attention, uh, and this is from your community, after the 2013 flood. Even while it was happening, I was wondering what the outcome was going to be. But here's a, a quote by Feltmate, who I think is at University of Waterloo, saying the big cost now is flooding basements by a country mile. So it's really high on insurance companies' screens. And radar screens. And the reason that, that this was got my attention is because of a 2006 study that some four undergraduate environmental science students did at University of Calgary. And I'll show you that in just, just a moment. So basement flooding, if it's just basement flooding and not overland flooding, then I would call that groundwater flooding. That means that the groundwater table moved up and it got higher and higher until it reached and then got higher than the elevation of the basement floor. And unless the basement is perfectly impermeable, which very few basements are based on the data that we're collecting, then you would have groundwater flooding at the home. And to my knowledge, all of the flood maps that have been created to date don't consider groundwater flooding in them. Okay, so before I talk about flood maps in Calgary, I just want to give you a primer of uh, groundwater uh, areas that are prone to flooding in Calgary. And if I really wanted to tell you where they were, then I might as well use this 1961 map that was made by an a Albertan hydrogeologist, Peter Myboom. And he was asked to map the probability of flooding in the city of Calgary. These are the limits of uh, Calgary in 1961. And the high area, highest areas are blue, the second highest areas are pink. And you can see that, in fact, what Peter did was he mapped the Bolt River as it flows through Calgary. This is the downtown here, and then on south, and the Elba River as it flows into Calgary and some of the old Elbow River channels. So those are areas which have river deposited permeable sands and gravels. And that's just about the only, where, only areas that you could put a well in and get a significant amount of water pumped out of it. And there, it's really easy to map these areas in Calgary. This is a topography map here where the highest elevation areas are pink and the lowest elevation areas are, are gray. And these river valleys, or river connected alluvial aquifers, I like to call them, are, they pop out very clearly as low elevation areas. This is a typical cross section. So if we could cut through the earth uh, from north to south here across the Bow River, then what we would see is bedrock here, and then we would see some superficial deposits from glacial times and, and soon after glacial times. And this area down here then is all the river-connected alluvial aquifer, and the river is actually quite tiny in it. 
So there's a little tiny river and then a big long plain, which is sometimes up to a few kilometers wide. And under this is all river connected alluvial aquifers. So I want you to imagine if there's lots of flow in this river and this river stage goes up, then what will happen because the sands and gravels in this deposit are so permeable is that the high stage will propagate back out into the aquifer. And if it intersects the basement, it'll flood the basement. Excuse me? Yeah. Is most of that uh, um, valley essentially carved by a glacial spillway? Like the width? Uh, the river is so small? Pre glacial and glacial. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And this small river, well, this small river over, over geologic time will meander back and forth across this and, and re incise it as well, which is what we saw in the Elbow River photograph that Jerry Osborne took. So these alluvial aquifers, they're deposited by the river, they are under and beside the river, really permeable and uh, really easy to map. And just to, give it, to get a sense of how high, how far these rivers have eroded into the surrounding sediments, this is the Center Street Bridge and it's, in, it's hard to get a picture that shows how effectively how high this escarpment is. But it's a serious uh, escarpment such that we have our Canada Olympic Park built on it. And this is uh, the parking here on the River Connected Alluvial Aquifer, and then you ski down the, the actual uh, escarpment that was carved into the bedrock from rivers. And uh, if you want to start your training for hiking in the city, then you can take these stairs up the side of the escarpment, just, just right beside the downtown. This is actually where some of the famous flood pictures were taken. And it's 11 stories climb that you go up and down in that case. So pretty serious escarpment. Okay, so that brings us to the flood maps here. And here are the provincial flood maps for the uh, part of Calgary. So this is the modern day Calgary boundary in orange. This is the Bow River coming in. It's the bigger of the two rivers, 10 times bigger than the Elbow River. And here's the Elbow River. They're both sourced in the mountains. And 90, more than 95% of the water that reaches Calgary in these rivers comes from the mountains because the mountains have higher precipitation, they have lower evapotranspiration. Once the rivers get into the prairie, we actually have more evaporation on average than precipitation in a year. So almost all of that river water comes from the mountains. And you can see that we have a floodway, which is darker red, a flood fringe, which is pink, and overland flow areas. And they pretty much just map these river valleys here. And I haven't talked much about Nose Creek because it's much smaller flow. It's first in the prairies, not in the mountains. Uh, but it is also flood, flood prone. OK, moving into talking about these maps a little bit then. The flood hazard areas are defined as the flood waves, which has fast moving flow during flood period based on these maps that were in existence in 2013 are based in a 1 in 100 year flood, which is conservative in many other jurisdictions. Uh, so floodway is fast moving water. Flood fringe is uh, moving water, but not necessarily fast moving water. And, and then overland flow happens in these areas. And they have a little cross section here, and they show that if you have this building here that's built up on an embankment that that might be a flood proofed building. But my point here is that if there was a basement in this building, then it would be subject to basement flooding and it wouldn't be flood proof. So really what we need to do is fill in these areas along the edge here with the groundwater flood hazard area. And the higher the flow in the river, the higher the elevation of the river, or we call it the river stage, and the higher the groundwater level is likely to be in the, in the near river areas. So here they have what they think is a floodproof building, but whether or not it's floodproof really depends on the elevation of the basement floor. That would be the depth of the basement, or what's, what's really important here is this uh, elevation of the basement floor relative to the, to the elevation of the river stage. So when I saw the presentation uh, on catastrophic losses and flooding and, uh, and went and talked about whether or not with the presenter about whether or not one able to predict whether or not you would have groundwater flooding. Uh, they thought not, but really that is uh, the basic tools of hydrogeology. So now I just want to give you a little, subject you a little bit to groundwater science here. I want to talk about groundwater and monitoring levels. So this is a cross section from the USGS, and you can see here the surface water. So this could be a river flowing out of the page, or it could be a lake. And there's a water level in the surface water, and the water level is propagated back into the sediments, and this is an appropriate uh, cross-section here 
because it shows all sands and gravels, which are pretty permeable here. In general, groundwater is flowing uh, into a river or out of a river, depending on, uh, depending on water levels, actually. But in general, there's a, there's a continuous surface. And if this formation is really permeable, like it is in the, in the Bow River alluvial aquifer, or the Elbow River alluvial aquifer, then it's a pretty flat water table. OK, if this, if this water level here goes up, then the groundwater level goes up. And if we have basements constructed in here, then, then we would have basement flooding. So how do we know what the water level is? So what we hydrogeologists do, our basic tool of the trade, is to install groundwater monitoring wells. Sometimes we do it by hand, but often we have to contract drilling rigs. So here's a picture of a drilling rig, and here's the mast here. And basically, they drill down, and they put little plastic pipes in the ground. So in, in the simplest sense, a groundwater monitoring well is usually a two-inch PVC pipe that goes down to some depth. And at the bottom, we cut holes in it, which we call slots. Sometimes we actually we drill them out, out with, a, with a drill. Sometimes we cut them or we buy them pre-drilled. And so what this does is let the, wa let the water enter the pipe only at depth. And so the water will rise in that pipe according to the pressure here. And, and you can then measure the water level in, in the top of the pipe. And we put transducers down and we monitor water levels continuously. So a standard uh, hydrograph, what we call a hydrograph in, in hydrogeology, would be measuring water levels so that you can see how it varies with time. So here we have an annual hydrograph. Lowest groundwater table is in March, and then, it, then spring and, uh, and rain happens, and the highest water table might be in September, depending where you are, et cetera. And these water levels, uh, these groundwater monitoring wells, sometimes they have stick-ups, sometimes they're flush-mounted. Now that you know what they are, you probably have seen them in your local parks, et cetera. And we can either use downhole pressure transducers, and we put down a water level tape, which has a tip which, uh, when it hits the water, it completes a circuit, which allows the battery in the, in the core of this to sound an alarm. And so you can measure how deep the water level is. That's the easiest thing in the world uh, for a groundwater person to do. So when you want to know whether or not basement flooding is because of uh, groundwater, high groundwater tables, then what you would simply do is, in, in the affected areas, install these groundwater monitoring wells and measure the elevation of the water table in the groundwater. If it's higher than the elevation of the basement floor, then it's a pretty logical conclusion that the flooding would have been from, from groundwater inundation. OK, so I want to go ahead now and talk to you about uh, what I know about groundwater flooding in Calgary and what we're doing to understand it now. And, uh, I want to start with a study that was done by some undergraduates after the 2005 flood, which wasn't nearly as big as the 2013 flood, but flooded quite a few houses in a very nice part of town called Rideau Roxborough. So this, you can see the Elbow River coming along through here, and it goes into the downtown here. So this is our stampede grounds, and uh, this is one of our major sports centers. And and the downtown is right over here. Uh, and then I've, I've marked in, this is a, a Google Earth photo, so it's not perfect, but I've marked in dashed yellow lines here the edge of that river-connected alluvial aquifer at the bottom and at the top. And so the, probably the few areas that aren't developed in downtown Calgary are escarpment areas, which are too steep to be built on. And so here, and here it is on the western side. So from here to here is all river-connected alluvial aquifer. On the inside of the river meander here, the, the ground elevation is a little bit lower. So these two districts, Rito Roxborough, which, as I mentioned, are two very lovely Tony districts, are amongst the first to get flooded when there's high flow in the elbow. And I work in the undergraduate, or I teach in the undergraduate environmental science program at the University of Calgary, where I have the great pleasure of working with uh, motivated, capable students that have come from a variety of science backgrounds and uh, we do year-long directed study projects in their fourth year, capstone course called Environmental Science 502. And they, they have some latitude in deciding what they'd like to study. And so these four students in 2006, when we were going to, the subject was lessons learned from flood 2005. They insisted that they wanted to do a door-to-door -door survey and understand the damages, most of the economic damages that happened from the flood in these two flood-affected towns. 
And the first thing I did was try to discourage them because I have had some experience with social science surveys and they're a lot more work than you think they are. They're a lot more difficult to design and execute and interpret than a physical scientist, a lowly physical scientist like me would think. But they were really determined that they wanted to do that and that's always a sign to me that, that something good is going to happen. And so we worked with Dr. Linda Henderson who teaches uh, in, at, at uh, University in Calgary and they did a fabulous job and as in all good science I think, what they found out was way more interesting than what they set out to find out. So here's their major, they, they surveyed 100 students, 100 homeowners in Rideau Roxborough and here's what they came home with. That overland, like the typical flooding that we think about, overland flooding only accounted for 17% of the economic damage reported by these homeowners. That means that 83% of the damage was caused by groundwater flooding. And that underground seepage was responsible for most of the flood damage and that the setbacks, so those flood maps that I showed you with a floodway and a flood fringe, were not very good at, uh, at predicting where the damage would be and that ground elevation was as predictive as of whether or not there would be damage as the distance from the river. So ground elevation wouldn't be as good as depth of the uh, elevation of the basement floor. Anecdotally, they reported that newer homes were flooded more often and they supposed that that was because they had higher ceilings and deeper basements and uh, more electronics, etc., in the basements as well. And in these projects, we take them to a public open house and everything seems to come together the night before the open house. And so it, we often work late into the night. And this is the, the diagram that these four capable students came up with uh, to express their findings. So here we have, it's not a great diagram, but it does a, does a job and I'm proud of them. So here we have the Elbow River, and this is a river connected to Olivia Lacqua for coming back from the Elbow, Elbow River. And we have some homes, and some of them are higher elevation than others, so the lower elevation homes are more susceptible to flooding. But really it's the newer homes with the nine foot basements that, that are, and at lower elevation, that are the most susceptible to flooding. So for the 40 student class, I think that the most important conclusions that came out of this fourth year study uh, was that the best way to prevent flooding is to regulate the basement, the elevation of the basement home with respect to the river stage. And that a better way, better than having distance from the river, which is overland flooding, a better way to zone areas would be by via the basement floor, basement floor elevation. So you could say it has to be above the one in a hundred stage or the one in 200 stage, depending on how how conservative you want to be. But that would be better than saying it should be 200 meters from the river or 400 meters from the river. Okay, so then flood uh, 2013 happened and I had a field school, an environmental science field school, so this isn't the, the year-long capstone course, this is a two-week uh, field school in which we do little, like five little projects, uh, many of which involve field work, and we decided to do a door-to-door -door survey with 40 students of a town site called Redwood Meadows. So here's Calgary here, and the Sutana First Nation uh, is these two sections here. And they have developed a town site right here on the Elbow River, so this is the Elbow River flowing into Calgary here, called Redwood Meadows, which is beautiful, rustic, uh, rural area. And the beautiful part of it, of course, is the Elbow River. We all would love to live beside rivers. And this is the view looking north from Redwood Meadows from a residential area uh, of the Elbow River during the flood. And when it's not in flood, when it's in low water, you can pretty much walk across this river. And the Sutana Nation were heroes in the eyes of the residents because they had a lot of heavy machinery in there and they prevented overland flooding from reaching the home, from reaching the town site. But they didn't prevent flooding. They, there was lots of groundwater flooding. And we decided to, to work in Redwood Meadows because I have a colleague who lived in Redwood Meadows and he said to me that there was all this discussion amongst the residents, very close-knit community, about how some areas were flooded and some areas were not. And I thought, well, maybe there's some hydrogeologic control. And I'll talk about PLO channels and potential hydrogeologic control later. And so these are the... 40 odd students who uh, went to more than 100 homes on a single day. And here's the setting here. So this is the Elbow River flowing up and then it goes across and into Calgary. 
this is the edge of the First Nation Reserve here, and the flood mapping only goes up into the reserve because that's provincial jurisdiction, but it's easy to imagine that it extends here through the river-connected Louisville Aquifer. And the, the uh, streets that belong to the town site of Redwood Meadows are right here, nestled up against the uh, river on the south side. So here's some of the results that, uh, that these undergraduate students reported to me. So one of the things that they asked was, uh, what is the characteristic of the water that flows into the house? And this is trying to separate out uh, sewage backup versus groundwater. And the wastewater collection system in Redwood Meadows is not only new, it was recently upgraded and improved. And so you can see that almost all of the flooding, this isn't going to be the same as what we find in Calgary, in the older areas of Calgary when our 2013 flood um, data are out. You can see that almost all the flooding was clear and non-odorous and was rarely dark or odorous. So that speaks to pure, clean groundwater entering the, the homes. Uh, where did that water first enter into your home? So usually it was through the sump pump. The fact that they have sump pumps suggests that, to, that their homes are susceptible to groundwater flooding, often through the floor drain. Foundation and cracks and often the very edge of the basement floor up against the wall is where water enters and other other areas. Just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, if they had not had a sump pump, and normally you need a sump pump in, in some of these areas, but if they hadn't had one, would it probably have come in through another area? Yeah, I think very few homes are, basement floors are waterproof. So it, it just came through the sump pump because that That's would be the easiest route of entry. I mean, if it hadn't been that way, it would have been, it would have been another way. Yeah, and I'm going to talk about that a bit at the end. But I will say that there's we had two homeowners tell us that they had a little bit of water leaking in from cracks, et cetera, and they thought that they could get rid of it by drilling a hole in the concrete. And in fact, that turned into a geyser, right? And we <laughs> that it was like a meter high of water coming in. Uh, and so here these students reported the estimated cost of the damage to homes with distance from the river, a weak correlation uh, suggesting that distance to the river might be important, but not a very clear correlation and here they have estimated damage with depth of basement below ground. And the deeper the basement, the higher the damage. So the distance from the river is not the way to predict risk to groundwater flooding. Okay, so now we wanted to move into a little bit uh, more science uh, methodology to estimate how far back groundwater levels would propagate. And so here we have uh, part of Eastern Calgary here, this river going by and it's eroding, uh, eroding the, to the street here. And so we ask ourselves, how far back is this propagating this high river stage? Is it flooding the homes of these basements now? And so we have started some preliminary modeling which looks at the water level in the groundwater, in the river connect of the groundwater, in the river connected to the aquifer with distance from the river. So I'll walk you through this. So this is the water level here, and the black dotted line is the river. So between January, February, March, April, it's going down, down, down. Typically it's lowest right before spring melt happens. And then it starts going up, and this would have been a usual year had there not been these significant rainstorms on frozen ground in the mountains. And so here's the flood peak here in mid-June, and then it comes down, down, down again. Okay, and here is here are different colored lines that represent the water level in the river connected alluvial aquifer at different distances from the river between 10 meters and 600 meters. And so 10 meters from the river, it's almost identical. 600 meters, it, it goes up about 1.25 meters and then goes down. So we can actually estimate uh, how far and how fast high groundwater levels propagate into the aquifer. The biggest problem in this estimation is a parameter that we call hydraulic conductivity or permeability, and that varies by orders of magnitude. And if we have that wrong, and it's really variable, you could have a paleo channel which could be two orders of magnitude higher than a, an overbank deposit. So that's the big uh, degree of freedom here that we don't understand well. And we can also, you know, using uh, these parameters, estimate the change in water level for a single day with distance from the river. So this is all hypothetical right now. It's all theoretical. 
theoretical. If we had some groundwater wells and if we had some hydraulic conductivity values that were measured in the aquifer pump test, then we could do a much better job here. And then using these theoretical calculations here, we have a, a groundwater flood risk map uh, based. So the overland flowing is overland flooding is in gray. That's based on uh, City of Calgary data. And then the students Jasper and Adrian here have indicated the areas in red, which they think would be groundwater flooding, assuming a basement that's two meters deep, I think. So as I mentioned, the big problem here is that we don't have a good estimate of hydraulic conductivity or resistance to flow. And we also need to understand the geology. So there could be paleo channels. Well, there are certainly paleo channels that are much, much more permeable. So this is the block diagram. We have a river flowing down here through sediments. And I showed you that picture of the Elbow River where it completely shifted its, its, its uh, riverbed, its uh, pathway, right? Filled up at the old riverbed, moved over to a new one. So where the old riverbed was will now be really, really permeable sediments because it was deposited in a fast-flowing river that you can't see, and unless you drill or unless you saw them before they were covered over, you won't know that they're there. And if the river level goes up, that'll be the first place that the, that the water goes in uh, faster. So if this water level went up here, then, then even though this paleo channel is subsurfaced, the water would go in here f faster, you know, 10 to 100 times faster is easy to imagine, and this area would flood first. So if you had basements here, they would flood first, and they would flood more frequently than basements outside the paleo channel. So that, that's a little bit of hydrogeology that would need to be understood. So we continue to work at the University of Calgary right now on the flood uh, 2013. We have funding from the City of Calgary and the University of Calgary, and we have a capable undergraduate student, Jason Aboud, who has managed to, uh, managed to well, he's worked with the team and we've surveyed more than 300 residents about the nature of flooding and the timing of the flooding and uh, how high it got in the basement In the basement, and we're going to work towards basement elevations, etc. So those data, I think, will be fascinating. Uh, some colleagues of mine, Adam Pizzosecki and John Lawton, are working with uh, students to use environmental geophysics to look for these paleo channels underneath uh, the ground and to, and then we want to identify and, and uh, ideally install in strategic locations and then monitor uh, groundwater levels in the river-connected alluvial aquifer so that we can actually start creating these models. And instead of having theoretical models, then we'll have models that are based in reality. So I'll just finish with some summary comments here. Uh, so I think it is pretty easy to differentiate between groundwater flooding and sewage backup if you use a standard groundwater monitoring well. And lots of jurisdictions do groundwater monitoring. So the city of Calgary doesn't do much. But the province of Alberta and every province in the country has got a groundwater monitoring network. It's really simple to do. The technology is tried and true. And it's not very expensive. Then the question, then the, the issue will be uh, having the residents understand the fact that groundwater I think can look like sewer flooding. So if you had bona fide sewer flooding, what you would happen is in this wastewater collection system, so there's two, this is actually a combined system where the stormwater and the wastewater, oh no it's not, sorry. This is a stormwater system, this is a wastewater system. Uh, so the drains in the basement all go into this collect, wastewater collection here, and if the the wastewater collection is clogged or if the pumps aren't working, then the water level in this system could go up higher than the basement floor and then you would get back up. Or if there was a clog, usually it's actually a clog in the system leading from the house. That's a, that's a sewer backup. But if you actually have a water table that's rising quite high, uh, then it will find its way into this collection system because they are rarely completely watertight, and particularly in old areas of cities, they're not watertight. In fact, we know that they leak uh, often. And so if the water table is going up around, is rising up around the collection system, the groundwater will enter into the collection system wherever there are cracks and then go up through 
through the collection system into the house. So that will look like sewer backup, but in fact it's groundwater flooding. And another, another diagram here from, from the Institute of Catastrophic Loss Reduction, which had some of the best materials that I found, I'm happy to say, or you should be proud about, they show here that there's deteriorating uh, clay drains that are collapsed, and so it's easy to imagine that if the water table goes up, it would enter these clay drains and, and go up these, into the basin. And we know also that the stormwater system is leaky in the city of Calgary. Uh, we have lots of information about that. And, Really, if it leaks into the alluvial aquifer, that just gives it a little bit more time before it makes it into the river rather than directly into the river. So I have to say that when we started working on groundwater flooding after the 2013 flood, I was really surprised that there's really only a handful of papers in the scientific literature about it. So if the insurance industry is thinking, man, I should have known that, they shouldn't feel badly because the groundwater science field didn't have very much knowledge about it either. So here's a 2011 paper that says that it's poorly understood, often confused with surface water flooding, and I would also say sewer backup, uh, and, and not widely recognized as a problem, neither in the UK where this study was done or internationally. And this study was prompted by some significant groundwater flooding events in the UK. So, this really, it's not often that my research goes into my home, but this research does. So this is my notice from my home insurance company, which uh, thanks me for choosing them to look after my home insurance needs. And, and they're giving me the heads up that my insurance premiums are going to go up significantly because of the flooding that has happened. And I don't live, I'm sad to say I don't live anywhere near the river. I'd love to near, live near the river, but I don't. And... So I presume that my insurance policy is going to go up significantly because many pay the cost for a few in insurance. But that should be for unexpected events. And I think that it's really clear that we know how frequently flooding will happen and we know pretty much where overland flooding will happen. And, uh, and we could know with a modest amount of work where groundwater flooding would happen. So I don't think it should be unexpected. Now the residents have a role in this because after the flood 2013 in, in Calgary, the province wanted to put a notice on everybody's land title that was flooded saying this property was flooded in 2013. And they resisted that strongly enough to have the province back down so this is not going to happen. And so we're leading ourselves up to the next time we have a flood and we go, wow, who can believe that? except for Jerry Osborne, who may still be instructing first year geology and saying, we won't be surprised to have a one in, we could have a one in 100 flood next year. And uh, out of the mouths of babes, so Jerry Osborne gave a talk to a grade two class in Calgary, and uh, these are the questions, they gave him some questions beforehand, and these are the questions that they had the courage to ask them, which are questions that many people don't have the courage to ask. Should we ever have built on the floodplain, should we continue to build on it, and should we rebuild on the floodplain? So, I could be completely uh, out of line here because I don't know that much about insurance, the insurance industry, but when I ask myself what could the insurance industry do to identify areas that are prone to groundwater flooding, it would be uh, strategic groundwater investigation, so understanding where these paleo channels are that would be flooded sooner and faster and water level mon monitoring and then this field investigation and water level monitoring then would be used to validate good groundwater models, the robust groundwater model, and that they, you might want to consider looking at the elevation of the basement floor with respect to the uh, river stage elevation at whatever flood interval you choose, one in a hundred, one in two hundred, <coughs> in terms of assigning risk to an individual property. So in conclusion, I had to bring up a Richard Scarry diagram because the ICLR diagrams reminded me of him and I loved his book so much when my kids were young. So I conclude that, that by saying that groundwater, the, the uh, outcome of groundwater flooding can be significant. So it probably didn't cause as much damage as overland flooding in 2013 in Calgary but in 2005, these students who surveyed 100 homes found that it caused 87% of the damage. 
and that the relevant parameter is the elevation of the basement floor in the home with respect to the river stage elevation at some flood interval. It can be masked by or look like sewer backup, so confused with sewer backup. Paleo channels are probably important, so basements that are built into paleo channels uh, will be more prone to flooding. And that some field investigation, groundwater monitoring, and groundwater modeling could go a long way to identifying these areas. And so I will close by thanking you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Um, oops, I was just going to say, we're looking at something like that. Um, groundwater flooding appears to be, it is covered now under a sewer backup endorsement. So if you've got that on your policy, at least say in Ontario, um, if you do get groundwater flooding, no one's going to go in and try and differentiate between a sewer backup and groundwater. The differentiation is whether it comes overland or underground. So the issue is going to be, is, you know, can you even write an endorsement to um, differentiate uh, groundwater flooding from sewer backup? And I don't think legally you could. I think you'd have to, you're going to have to look at both of those together and keep them together as from an insurance policy point of view. So then the question is, are you going to provide in places like Calgary any coverage whatsoever? The issue right now is, is if it's zoned for residential, um, it's assumed that it is safe to be in in terms of even overland flooding, therefore that's not even covered, and um, that it is actuarially uh, sound to provide coverage for uh, groundwater and, and sewer backup, and that's only removed um, as it's proven to be otherwise. So, let me so there's, there's three or four disciplines that come together here, yeah. and they don't necessarily mesh, and that's the problem. So I can't speak to whether or not it's legally sound to endorse I might be using the wrong language here, sewer backup and groundwater uh, flooding or sewer backup mass, groundwater flooding that's masked as sewer backup. I don't know if you can distinguish between those legally, but you sure as heck could scientifically or technically with some groundwater monitoring. The issue, of course, is can you take that into a court, court of law right. and, and deal with it? And, and I, I wouldn't want to put it that way. So what we do, what we hydrogeologists do is in an area, I work on a an aquifer south of Abbotsford called the Abbotsford Aquifer and I work with Environment Canada who has a network of 15 wells and they monitor the water in those wells and so you can interpolate, you can draw a map, a contour map of the water table on any given day with very good confidence because it's a smooth surface. So I think that if you had 15 groundwater monitoring wells in those districts of uh, of Calgary that you could very easily determine the elevation of the water table at any given point. It's just, yeah, just a matter of going and finding a way to refer differentiate those in a uh, in a court of law and that would be tough because then you've got to write the exclusion in a manner that or write the policy in a manner that differentiates those. It's very easy to differentiate between overland and not overland but I'm not sure you know you'd have to be bringing in all of these groundwater uh, monitoring systems and as a, as a simple exclusion or a simple Paul, a simple endorsement, I don't think it would work. Now, the interesting thing is, I you might want to address because you don't think the science would be believable. I don't think that you could differentiate in a court of law in front of a judge um, that you'd be able to write a, a, a legal endorsement that would be able to take that into account. Yeah, because sometimes you could you could have both. You know, yeah. where are you going to go? Order, how much of it? How much of that flooding? <clears throat> even though it came through the underground, so technically, but then how, how much of it is groundwater, how much it is sewer backup, so that, that, would, that, that would all be the, I think the, the, the insurance yeah. point of view, it will be, they'll come down to having, and they were, in Calgary, they've already redone the, the flood maps, uh, I believe. And, yeah, uh, trying to get on it. I think it's going to have to be where, if it's, if it's in a flood zone, pretty soon, uh, there'll be no insurance, so, you know, there's... Well, no, if you're in a zone where essentially you could have groundwater flooding, my feeling is you could ex you'd exclude both groundwater and sewer backup. Mm -hmm. okay. But I find it interesting that you're not even close and they're excluding it, which is kind of weird or might exclude it because it's kind of weird. Normally that's done on a risk-by-risk -risk basis. If the person never had a claim on that, um, then the line is, well, why are we excluding it? They're not on a floodplain. They never had uh, a sewer backup. Um, that's rather strange that they do that. Well, it'd be, it, I, I can't speak to that, yeah. but uh, 
it would be hard to have groundwater flooding without significant risk of backing up yep. the sewers. But that's not sewer backup. That's inundation of collection system with groundwater. Yeah, and, yeah. But when you try and write that legally mm -hmm. uh, in an endorsement, especially a short one, you can't do it. It's the same sort of thing when we run into a hurricane. Uh, hurricane damage is quite often, uh, or, or not, or water damage in a hurricane is excluded unless the roof is opened up and then the water comes in. And then the thing is, well, we don't know whether the damage was caused by the wind or water, therefore we pay. So you have all of these oddball um, so what talk, if? talk in terms of or oddball uh, situations as to when you pay and when you don't. What if you could only have sewer backup coverage if the groundwater level was below the basement? Floor that could be done. Yeah. That could be written. And, and matter of fact, you probably you wouldn't even do that. You just simply say, in you know, given this particular set of circumstances and the fact you'd have a couple of losses, we will exclude. Right. Right. Usually, it's the losses that cause the exclusion. Um, yeah. But in, in Ontario, we had issues here where we were having huge amounts of sewer backup losses, and they were sewer backup, and that appeared to do, be to the fact that the sewers were being overloaded, and we had huge problems being you know able to in the end being able to even recover from that because uh, the province then wrote the, rewrote the law and said you can't uh, recover under nuisance, you have to recover under negligence, which is a much higher legal bar. And then these sort of things come in. You know, As I said, it's where the science collides with the law and there's not right. a, right. a good interface at all. I don't, I don't understand the differentiation between groundwater-related sewer backing, uh, backup and, say, rainfall-derived uh, inflow sewer backup. You have sewer backup is sewer backup. It's excess water and surcharging of, of the sanitary yeah, yeah, as I said, when you try and rewrite that endorsement and say, if the groundwater is above your um, above your basement, we won't pay, Yeah, that's going to be but they're, hard they're just, to pull but off. That, so, it, I mean, you could probably differentiate that in, if, if it's only groundwater and only river flooding, but if it occurs at the same time as any, any amount of rainfall, it's going to be pretty hard to differentiate um, because you can have sewer backup with 10 millimeters of rain. So, but are you talking about because of combined sewers or no, the stormwater and the sanitary like the, together, or the major, because of the water level going up? Well, the major driver of of sewer backup on on separated sewer systems is inflow infiltration. Infiltration is the groundwater component, and inflow is direct connections of the surface surface water. Um, and it it would be really hard to differentiate what portion of the sewer backup is caused by inflow versus infiltration. I think and infiltration is an ongoing, equally addressed problem. And if I was arguing that in court, I would argue exactly the same thing as I would argue with Hurricane. You know, once you get the uh, the the roof is open and water starts coming in through an open roof, well, it doesn't matter how much is there, you pay. Right. So you can't differentiate between the damage done from the wind and the damage done from the water, and that might actually act as a precedent, a legal precedent. Uh, the other thing is, is that I guess from a, a claims adjustment point of view, I would far rather deal with clean water in a basement than I would actually sewer backup. I've dealt with sewer backup claims, and they are the absolute worst. You know, there's no, the homeowner has absolutely no patience whatsoever, and then obviously not. If you have sewage in your basement, you want it cleaned, you want it out, you want it out now. With clear water, they might be willing to wait a bit. But, well, in, in some cases, you have clear water in your basement from sewer backup because if you get enough yeah, in yeah. Low, it could appear to be pretty clean water, even though it's coming. Like in the like area of Toronto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in Toronto. But in Toronto, it's, it's interesting because a lot of the homes are built like what we call now they look like beautiful little valleys so if you have a nice home now in a sort of night it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of trees and it's forest and, and what they are is they are old riverbeds that oh, are yeah. right yeah. and if you look at an old map of 1800s in toronto there's a whole bunch of creeks and rivers yes, the was telling and whereas you now know. now we're basically within toronto oh. there's probably no creeks except for the don and the humber all oh. these other ones are now little river under, valley or underground up, and they're, or they're underground they're yeah so you got, I mean, there's the whole, there's the insurance coverage issue, which is obviously kind of sticky, but the, yeah. the whole land use planning and, and, you know, management of growth is a whole other issue, which is, has a much more... Yes, zoning, a giant, you know, giant, uh, it, you know, giant blinking letters. <laughs> and, yeah, and, well, zoning, I mean, obviously, like, it's, it's the land use planning and zoning for flood control, I mean, the grade two's got it, right? Everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but it, when you actually get down to implementing the policy, there's always huge resistance from you know developers and even the city and often yeah, you know, and homeowners. Homeowners have an aversion to any sort of risk assessment that we And legally, really once about. they've zoned it, and it's zoned for residential, legally it's considered safe until it's obviously not. Yeah. And that's one of the big issues, uh, you know, because I don't think insurers want to be de facto zoners, mm. um, because that's what happens when you start excluding all of these things. Yeah. The insurer becomes the zoner. But you're absolutely right, when you, and, and this has been noted for floodplains. If you build in a floodplain, it's not if, it's when. And that's the only question, is when, and is 1 in 100 an acceptable return period? I would say probably not. So, well, so I've seen a, a list of a bunch of Canadian jurisdictions and the Netherlands, and Alberta using 1 in 100 is the least conservative of all of the Canadian jurisdictions. Like in Ontario here, we had a Hurricane Hazel that came through. It created the uh, Conservation Authority, and under that mandate, uh, most of the lands that were floodplains were turned into parks. Now, there's always pushback to try and go into those areas, but by and large, if you go near the Dawn or near Highland Creek or whatever, you'll find a park because, well, it's a floodplain, and if it's mm -hmm. a floodplain, it, well, floods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and even that 1 in 100 target is a moving target because in that 1983 uh, flood, uh, floodplain delineation study that I showed you, there were two lines and they were two different uh, time periods. So. Maybe as the climate's changing, we'll get more floods, and that 1 in 100 stage will actually get higher. And it's everything from climate change to just how long is your measurement period. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And of course, in insurance, so it all comes down to dollars. So when you say the 1 in 100, it all depends on how much that costs you. Um, and of course, a, a, a 1 in 100 flood, let's say in 1800, would have cost a lot less than that. Uh, especially now, especially in Southern Ontario, and I assume in Alberta the same thing, where increasingly people are finished their basements. So that's the other thing. We have new, we have new full basements, but not only are they like deeper, they're like deeper. Say, <laughs> deeper, but they're also now completely finished. So you well, know, twenty-seven I, inch plasma TVs. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so you know, a, a, a flooded basement now is like a forty-five, fifty thousand dollar claim. Yeah. So like that might be an impetus for change. You see. In, in the uh, well, sort of the context of Williams Plain, there's more to it than just the. I think when it comes to groundwater, you might still be able to, to build in these areas. It just comes down, like you're saying, basement floor depth. And there are, you know, planning regulations right now. I gave a presentation to a group of builders uh, a few months ago. One of the builders came up to me and and asked, and he said, "We're building development in Toronto right now. We know the basement floor slab is below the groundwater level. All the all the homes we have built." have, you know, six inches of water, and it wasn't until they put the sumps in and pumped the water out that they were clear. And he said, we know this is a problem, but the planning regulation in the area doesn't allow us to build a building higher than a certain level. Hmm. So this is driving the basement floors lower. So it's not necessarily you can't build in these areas, it's just adjusting. But they could have a shallower basement or even a slab on grade if necessary. Yeah, a slab on grade or, or even increase the height of, of the whole home. You can still have an yeah. Well, the sump holes will work for a while, but what happens when you start getting cracks in the basement? I mean, there's gonna get, they're going to get water coming through no matter what. Well, if you've got a the weeping tiles overload. Yeah, it, well, that's the thing. So, and the weeping tiles won't weep if they're below the water table. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the home that you said in... in in the uh, Aboriginal lands there, uh, west of Calgary. Yeah, the Redwood Meadow. Yeah, the um, the the water is coming in through the sump, and is that because they the pumps were failing, or the pumps were overwhelmed? Like, did you, did you get a sense? Because they're overwhelmed. That that is so permeable that that material that you couldn't pump. Okay. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Basically, so it's it's you know it's heterogeneous material, but I'm aware of one pump test in uh, South. Southern Calgary on the the Lacro for where they got a, a large amount. I don't remember how, but they only got 10 centimeters of drawdown in the well and nothing. Right, right. So it's really, and really what you're pumping is what we call groundwater under the influence of surface water because the river just comes in and recharges. Yeah. The, so you're pumping out the whole river. Yeah, which you couldn't do. <laughs> Any cubic meters a second. Kathy, yeah, I was talking about some of these issues with um, some builders. And these people were based in Atlantic Canada, and I won't get the community names right, so I'm going to try. But they were saying that in those communities, they've not allowed basements for years. They only allow homes to be built 
slab on ground or whatever the right terms to be used. Um, to what extent is Calgary unique or different or special? What, what, why, why would groundwater perhaps be a different issue in Calgary or a greater issue in Calgary than maybe some communities? So it's only an issue, what we've been talking about today, in these thin strips of land, you know, which is anywhere from one to three kilometers along the river-connected Luvial Aquifer at the bottom of these escarpments. So the escarpment gets complicated in the downtown because there were old rivers that flowed different ways and the whole downtown is built on uh, river-connected Luvial Aquifer. So it's really only in these thin strips of land. So uh, there's been lots of pressure on the Alberta government and the Alberta government is seriously considering major civil engineering works which include dry dams and uh, a tunnel to short-circuit the flow of the elbow so that it doesn't go through the elbow in Calgary, but in fact goes through a tunnel into the bow down gradient of Calgary. And my colleague has counted up the number of homes that that would protect from flooding. It won't affect the downtown flooding because the most recent flood maps show that, that the elbow doesn't flood into the downtown. And that would be like paying out homeowners, each of these homeowners, a significant amount so that they don't have flooding. And there's the Calgary Stampede and some industry there. Industry has flooding. I think the Calgary uh, has flood insurance. I think the Calgary Stampede does too. Uh, so it's not a very big area of Calgary, but the most expensive properties are on the river, which is interesting because that's the reverse situation of so many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, we also started a conversation earlier, and maybe you can get the, the key elements of it, but there are some communities where um, there were uh, streams and rivers going through the urban area, but it's been paved over or lost in, in the urban development or whatever. Um, and these areas where water used to flow quite regularly are not quite as evident, and in some cases it was always under the ground and you wouldn't necessarily, just a, a normal person walking around wouldn't know what to look for or whatever. To what, in, to what extent can groundwater be a really important issue in areas where it's not yeah. necessarily quite visible? That's a good question. And I, I wouldn't say, like, I wouldn't say that those areas are important just since, you know, last hundred years of urban development. I think they're important for the last thousands of years as the rivers migrated back and forth. I think they're critical. I don't think that you can very easily stop natural groundwater flow from going where it used to. You can do it, but it takes significant thought and engineering to do it. So, for instance, in the front ranges of the Rocky Mountains in the Kananaska Valley, there's a little creek, usually a little creek except during flood, called Evan Thomas Creek. And they rerouted it to build the Kananaskis Golf Course, which is a beautiful golf course. And the flood came through, and the Evan Thomas pretty much trashed the whole golf course as it went back to its original channel. Uh, so you can change it for a little bit, but don't expect it to stay that way. So one, the thing is that it's pretty easy for a geologist or a hydrogeologist to map these areas and to know where they are. And, and part of that mapping or people who are used to elevation mapping or inundation mapping or something like that, that's not what you're looking for in this case. Subsurface mapping, subsurface hydrogeological mapping. And to what extent does that exist in particular for urban areas? Do you take that off a shelf somewhere because it's already been done? Well, the groundwater resources of the Calgary area, 1961, that pretty much shows what you need to know for Calgary. Another really important resource in terms of 100 years of urbanization is air photos. So now that we have Google Earth, everybody looks at uh, images, satellite images, but there are lots of archived air photos that you can look at in stereo, with a stereoscope, and you can see elevation, you can see three dimensions. You know, like those, those photographs that you look at where you can see a different picture if you look at them the right way. And that gives you way more information, and they date back we have them in Calgary from the 1910s, and so they date back well before there was significant urban development. They are also very useful. I think in the end, the issue has to inform a lot of zoning, at least in newer areas where you're doing new development. Is well, what is groundwater? What is the return period? And are we willing to accept this or not? To, to pick up on Mark's important point here, are you aware of a community, particularly in Canada, but that has taken groundwater? and seriously thought about it from a zoning point of view and said we have different expectations for new buildings or anyway they, they've really tried to apply it to local planning type work and, and take groundwater really seriously. 
I wish I could say I was, but I can't think of one. That'd be a good question for the, there's an association of municipalities, right? Mm -hmm. I push point and say, what about New Orleans? New Orleans being below sea level, and I keep hearing stories where you can't even bury a body because it'll float up and things like that. I mean, there's some international communities that might come to your mind. Well, Netherlands. Netherlands. Netherlands, yeah. And these folks from the Netherlands came with that expertise. But they don't have deep basements with 27 inch plasma screens. Okay. Sure. And they have constant pumping. And, and again, from an insurance perspective, we often talk about basements as a great way to give a strong foundation against strong winds because you you now have your home anchored for let me, uh, let me, reducing earthquake risk or something. You want a basement to, in some cases, but not for flooding. Let me ask you a question in a different way. So, so you keep pointing out that it's really the zoning that's the problem. But could insurance premiums inform zoning de facto, de facto informing of zoning. So if you were to say we will give you flood insurance if you live on the floodplain, but it's going to cost you according to the depth of the, the elevation of the basement floor, is there a precedent where insurance, the availability of insurance has has informed policy that way? And definitely fire is one of those. Yeah. If you have a community that invests in more fire halls and quality people, etc., uh, the industry takes third-party analysis of the risk of fire damage and said the risk has gone down. We will uh, reward everybody in that community by lower the price of insurance. So I've seen mayors stand up saying, I've spent money on the fire protection for our community and the benefit to everybody will be lower insurance. Fire is the most visible one that the industry has been actively working on for years and years and years. Um, and auto insurance is yet another area where if you have a certain kind of vehicle that is less likely to be damaged in an accident or a certain right. kind of driver who consistently shows through training or whatever the are less likely, they're rewarded. The cost of insurance goes down, and those right. who behave poorly, the charge is very, very high until they start behaving again. No, the flood, though, was very problematic in that area. I mean, every time I think we tried to do something like that, it runs up against the zoning issue, and it's zoned, it's safe, and that's it. Flood is an interesting issue in that in most countries around the world, you can get government flood insurance or private flood insurance, but some of the government flood insurance are not related to risk. In France, everybody pays the same and everybody gets flood insurance, but it doesn't matter whether you're on top of the hill or at the bottom of the hill, the rate's the same. Um, so having uh, private insurance companies come in, measure the risk, put a price that reflects the risk, that's what insurance companies do if allowed the freedom to follow through. But in some cases, uh, public things called insurance are not actually reflecting the risk, so they fail to do it. Or private companies would like to do it, but regulation can come in in places like Florida where they identified high risk but weren't allowed to charge the full price that they needed to charge. That either leads to affordability problems or absence of insurance in some cases. So it depends on whether the market's allowed to do what it does. But uh, most examples where insurance does come in and has the flexibility to do its job, it'll put a high price on high risk and a low price on low risk and encourage people to become low risk. Right. That was kind of the idea behind the National Flood Insurance Program in, in the U.S. And then it kind of went south from that. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a few few examples of um, people offered in flood insurance in in Calgary over the past few months, in but very expensive, like thousands of dollars per year. But it's optional again. Um, if I come back to um, local governments actually taking changing their practices, whatever, development, codes, et cetera, um, based on groundwater. Um, is it more knowledge they need? Is it better information they need? Uh, when Calgary is interacting with you to learn more about the kind of science you have and what it means for Calgary, what, what, what's the city looking for if it would like to? I'll tell you action? what I think they need. I, so the <coughs> issue is, so, so we, I showed you the slide where the residents really resisted having titles put on properties that were flooded. So I think what the city, and the city of Calgary is 100% cooperative in this research and all kinds of research. I'm really proud of the city of Calgary because I think they're really forward looking and interested in collaborating and learning and improving. What they need is for the average Calgarian to understand what's going on and to vote municipally accordingly. That is the problem, I think. 
And uh, some of the work I did when I was invited to be part of the Calgary Expert Committee looking at the flooding from last year, we saw a lot of the polling done in the city, inviting typical people in the city to comment on, on what happened. And you saw this outpouring of generosity. Here's someone in need. Let's yeah, go help them. Let's be there, which was yeah. wonderful. Third. But at the same time, some very strong views saying these people who are choosing to live in the floodplain, I don't want to help them again and again and again. The taxpayer should not be regularly spending public money to support people making bad choices. Uh, coming through with a, a strength of opinion that was very, very strong. Um, uh, yeah. Quite, quite interesting. Some of the views the public do hold, whether it's swaying activities or choice, but but some strong views in Calgary. Well, disaster management is like that. When you have the you know the initial disaster, and as long as everyone feels that their interests are combined, everybody pulls together. As soon as those interests start to diverge, well, then the response and recovery all diverge. And as I think, as soon as people started to perceive, hey, wait a minute, this could be here forever, they started to talk about it and. It diverged from the interests of the people who are sitting on the floodplain. I think zoning is also affected by uh, the developers. Uh, developers do a good job at what they're intended to do, and they they work long and hard in order to get areas that people want to live in developed, and they're not usually the best areas for development. So that's another big challenge, I think, for the city of Calgary. And people's perception of risk, it's a long way away and the usual thought, oh, one in 100, that's 100 years from now. Yeah. Not yeah. true, but well. So the average perception. Calgarian, if you were to ask the average Calgarian if they thought the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars that the, gov the provincial and the city, provincial government and the municipal government are thinking of spending on these flood intervention programs, is that a good cost? You know, four or five years after flood 2013, that won't be on the, on the radar screen during the municipal election. So my hope is that it's on the radar screen in a fair, in a fair way, in a balanced, objective way. If there were uh, two or three research projects you would like to move forward looking at groundwater in Calgary, are you able to be specific in describing what research questions you would most like to look at? Yes, I think that we need a network of strategic groundwater monitoring wells installed with a particular kind of drilling that allows us to take uh, good cores of the sand and gravel so that we can have a look at the aquifer and see how variable it is and then monitor them in tandem with the river water stage over a few seasons and construct a robust flow model, groundwater model to show how the water levels in the, in the alluvial aquifer change seasonally as the river goes up and down. And then show some nice cross sections with actual basement depth. And then, uh, you, know, you know, there's one area of town that which we sampled in the 2013, after the 2013 flood, where I met with the residents in the city of Calgary, and the residents are convinced that the city of Calgary, what they do is they close off the storm water outfalls during the flood so that the river doesn't go back up. But they think that because this particular storm water collector takes water from up above the escarpment, that in fact, and it was closed off, so they think it flooded their basements. And I hope that the flood mapping or the, the door to door survey that, that we've done will show whether or not that may or may not be the case. Uh, so, a couple of interesting areas like that to integrate in the municipal infrastructure and its performance as well as so monitor the water levels and the stormwater collection and the, and the wastewater collection systems and see how they perform in, when the water table goes up during flood periods. Of course, when you deal with natural science, which I've done my whole professional life, you might get that all in place, and then you might have low water level for the next two years. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually, the guy who built Duff Stike got his uh, his reward, so to speak. The guy who built Duff Stike out in, Winni out in Winnipeg. Right, right. So eventually, you're recognized. Did you when so the, is a survey from the 2013. But is that still going on, or is that completed for the three years? So we're not going out anymore, going door to door, but we decided to leave the, the URL open so people can do it online. Oh, okay. Because and we've had other communities come to us and say, will you come and do our community next? But we've got an offering for what, we, what we're, uh, we have funds to support right now. Yeah, right. Is there anything in there, let me get to see the, the, the survey if possible, but is there anything in there that would 
basically just saturated people's acceptance of, of the different types of flooding. And one of the things we found surveying people, people are usually really angry about two backup kits. Mm. The city, they didn't uh, <coughs> properly. But overland flooding is a little more accepted because it's extreme rainfall, that's nature, that happens. And when you do have cases where it's just seepage, like clearly seepage is coming in through the floor, um, some people kind of see that as just, well, that's just what happens with basements. Um, you know, minor sort of seepage that, that yeah. happens frequently. I don't know if that's... Well, it's interesting. So, so this is like the fifth survey that I've done with students. And in the first number of surveys, I worked with a colleague, social scientist, Dr. Linda Henderson, who really taught me a lot and led me along. And, and anybody that we talk to about these surveys, they are blown away by the participation rate that our students get because they knock on the door. You know, you get a phone call and you say, I'm so-and-so. If that so-and-so says, I'm Jason and I'm doing an undergraduate thesis and I wanted to ask you some questions, then people are much more likely to take the time of day. And the two Dutch students that came and worked with us, they're just in the last stage of their master's and this is their final internship that they had to do. And uh, they, can, they come from a quantitative hydrology program. And they looked at the social science surveying that we had planned to do and they said, oh, our Dutch supervisors would just shake their heads at that. But they were amazed at the information that Jason was, was getting. And, you know, they went out and surveyed uh, with Jason for a couple of days as well, the information that, that these surveys can yield. So I forget your question, Paul. Oh, I was just wondering if they... If uh, they Dan, yeah. <laughs> sorry. So the, the, um, the sort of feeling of the homeowners was regarding like acceptance of... Yeah, yeah. So one good thing is that we were a year out. Yeah. I wouldn't have wanted to do it a month out. Right. But a year out, uh, I think almost all of them were really happy to discuss and... and yeah. They weren't like more angry about one type no. of thing than the other. So no. They kind of viewed all the same. Okay. Yeah. We, We've been trying to support this kind of work for a while, and uh, at a mix, we did one after the Pine Lake tornado, and we sent the team three years afterwards. Camping a half an hour from there. And uh, the uh, fire chief broke down in tears three years later, and one of the families being interviewed, somebody was just getting out of the hospital after being in hospital for three years. You never quite know what the timing. You don't want to do one month out, but sometimes even a year is time. Um, but one of the things in particular where Dan leads a lot of the, this kind of survey work that we've done, um, besides getting into homes, which is very hard, getting into homes, actually see what happened where water was in and, and try to look why and where it came in, try to find a few homes where the water never got in, yep. particularly homes next door kind of thing. Yep. Right? Yeah, that's what so, you so you know the ground level got to a certain level and it got into that home and you can look at it. But, but do remember to go into the place next door where it didn't get in, see if you can figure out why. So Jason nailed it because he'd done actually geology field school with Jerry Osborne, the superficial geologist. And, and, and Jerry always taught me, map as you go. So he'd go until he got no home flooded for a while, and then he'd come back and he's mapping as he go which homes were flooded and which homes weren't flooded in the fringe. Great. So we've got some independent data that we could chat about sharing just, just to reinforce yeah. what you're planning with that, if that's helpful. Fascinating. Okay, uh, well, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Ryan. And thanks very much, everybody on the line. Uh, hope to see you next time for the uh, webinar on I did earlier, so. the Triple M study on flood maps in, in Canada. Thank you very much. Right. You guys.